everyone, and welcome to this presentation, which is part of the Anabios webinar series. I'm Andre Getty, the CEO of Anabios Corporation. Anabios is a unique contract research organization based in San Diego, California. We're entirely focused on translational research, which is conducted utilizing human tissues recovered from ethically consented donors. We have uh, developed methods and compositions that allow us to maintain the viability and function of recovered human tissues and cells. And these technologies enable the study of drug activity in human ex vivo preparations or the investigation of pathological mechanisms of disease states in authentic human disease tissue. Over the years, we have applied these methodologies to support translational research in a variety of therapeutic areas. We've been especially active in pain research with work conducted on human dorsal root ganglia neurons. And more recently, we have expanded these activities by developing capabilities to recover viable human spinal cord. In a major effort, which involves uh, the collaborations between Anabios, Eli Lilly, and the group of Mike Hildebrand at Carleton University in Canada, we're exploring novel approaches to study spinal pain circuits. And our speaker today is uh, Dr. Mike Hildebrand. But before I introduce Dr. Hildebrand, I'd like to briefly talk about our second annual research grant. Anabios is committed to enabling human focused uh, drug discovery in areas of high end med medical need, including cardiac disease, chronic pain, respiratory, and kidney diseases. And that's why we're pleased to announce our second annual translational research grant for an ad award of $15,000 in high quality human tissue samples from Anabios to help the winning researcher advance his or her translational research project. In addition, we will award a 25% discount to the 10 highest ranked application for the future purchase of Anabios tissue samples. To submit your application, please upload your abstract with a detailed explanation for the intended use of human tissue. The deadline for submitting your abstract is June 30th, 2022, and award winners will be announced uh, on July 30th. Please visit our website at anabias.com for uh, additional details and terms and conditions. And now back to our speakers today, uh, Dr. Mike Hildebrand. Dr. Hildebrand completed his PhD in cellular neuroscience in Terry Snatch's lab at the University of British Columbia. He used patch clamp electrophysiology techniques uh, to characterize how the regulation of voltage-gated calcium channels impacts neuronal excitability. Following this work, uh, Dr. Hildebrand pursued an industrial R&D fellowship at Zalikus Pharmaceutical in Vancouver, where he developed an ex vivo rodent spinal cord recording assays for Zalikus preclinical pain research program. To further expand his expertise in spinal uh, pain processing, Dr. Hildebrand then completed a postdoctoral fellowship in Mike Salter's lab at SickKids Hospital in Toronto. In the Salter lab, Dr. Hildebrand investigated how the differential expression and regulation of synaptic and MDA receptors contributes to both physiological as well as pathological mechanisms of pain. Dr. Hildebrand is now leading his own pain research program as an associate professor at Carleton University and an affiliate investigator at the Ottawa Hospital, where his team is studying both acute and chronic pain processing using animal and human tissue pain models. Um, please keep in mind that we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and attendees will be able to enter questions in the box at the bottom of the webinar browser, or uh, virtually raise their hand and we'll give them uh, um, the ability to directly ask the question, ask the question to Dr. Hildebrand. Um, all right, so Dr. Hildebrand, please take it from here. Thanks so much, Andre and Anna Biles, for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. And thank you to the audience for tuning in and as the summer approaches for tuning in to this webinar. So my research is really investigating the molecular mechanisms that regulate excitability within spinal nociceptive circuits. 
And as we're investigating these spinal mechanisms of pain, we're using a translational approach where we're taking our findings from these typical, typical rodent um, preclinical models of pain and then testing whether similar mechanisms occur within human tissue using novel human spinal tissue assays, which I'll be talking about today. But before, and so the ultimate goal of that is obviously to identify new potential therapeutic targets for, for treating chronic pain, which we all know is very debilitating, costly, and we have a lack of, of effective treatments. So if we look at the, the pain pathway, we have peripheral sensory neurons that detect noxious stimuli, um, transduce them into neuronal or electrical signals, which are ultimately converted into action potentials, which then propagate down these primary afferents and enter into the to, to the spinal cord where they synapse onto second order spinal pain processing neurons. These neurons within the superficial dorsal horn then relay those messages up to the brain pain matrix that ultimately encodes the unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that we know of as pain. So when we're looking at this at the spinal no, um, dorsal horn, we can sometimes think, okay, it's a relay. It's a relay center between where pain signals are detected and ultimately processed. But in reality, this dorsal horn, the superficial dorsal horn, can play, contains a highly complex neuronal network that as well as receiving those incoming signals, receives local excitatory and inhibitory interneuron synaptic connections, as well as descending modulation from the brain. And it's only after integrating all of those signals that you have the, the pain outputs then ultimately going back up to the brain. And because there's so much processing that's occurring in terms of nociception within these spinal dorsal horn circuits, you could see how if you lose the proper regulation of balance between excitation and inhibition within these circuits, you could ultimately have increased excitability and, and pathological pain. And that's true, not just for the spinal cord, that's true for neurons throughout the nociceptive pathway, including the periphery and including the brain. And so researchers such as myself are trying to understand what those molecular targets are that can cause this loss of, of, of balanced excitability to potentially treat this and to treat chronic pain. And so this research has led to the identification of many different targets. And so this is just a recent review by Yakar Ali and Clifford Wolf's group highlighting some of the targets that have been identified within the peripheral nociceptors as well as within the second order dorsal horn neurons. And for each of these targets shown here, there are agents that act on them that are currently under some form of clinical trial testing. So, so there, are, there are emerging targets, there are basically shots on net here in terms of making a difference in the clinic and, and new therapies. But the bad news is, at least to date, and this is this could be changing, but at least to date, we have had a, a track record of a lack of success. This is just a quote from another fairly recent review by Frank Preckett's group, just saying that there's there's been a lack of drugs successfully reaching the clinic. And I think that's caused all of us as researchers to kind of rethink what we're doing and, and try to develop additional approaches to help increase the success rate of bringing discoveries from the target level all the way to the clinic. And so as we highlight, just to, just to highlight maybe some of the challenges here, I thought rather than kind of being general, let's look at one specific target. And obviously I'm biased here. This is a target that, that I am deeply interested into in terms of investigating its role in neurobiology and pain processing. And so that is the NMDA receptors. So NMDA receptors are excitatory glutamate receptors that are activated when their agonists, both glycine and glutamate bind. And when they're activated by these agonists, they become permeable to cations and the influx of sodium and calcium into the postsynaptic, um, into the postsynaptic side causes both depolarization, so electrical signaling within synapses, as well as since these receptors are calcium permeable, it enables downstream calcium mediated biochemical signaling, which can ultimately lead to changes in gene express and expression and plasticity. But one point here is that really the NMD receptor is, forms the core of a real signaling complex here at excitatory synapses. So there's many upstream regulators. There's also many downstream signaling effectors that, that, that the receptors can, can act on. And so besides the receptor being a potential target, some of these regulators and the signaling that, that le that's led to downstream can also be potentially targeted in terms of novel therapeutics. And that's kind of the lens that we're, we're viewing this as we study it. <clears throat> 
One final point before I move on here, because it's going to be relevant in, um, in the second half of the talk, is there's different varieties of, of these NMD receptors. There's four different genes that code for this glutamate binding gluN2 subunit. And depending on that gene, whether it's GLUN2A, B, C, or D, they have different functional properties, different um, regulation properties as well. And so they can have different physiological roles. And we'll see why that's relevant in a little bit. But in terms of going back to pain as this being a target, there have been clinical trials that have that have tested currently um, clinically approved agents that are known to act on, at least partially, NMD receptors in the context of pain. And so this, sorry, that was gluten 2 So there's been a recent systematic review here on the on these NMD receptor antagonists, at least in the context of neuropathic pain. And what you see here is that for the majority of studies have shown some clinical benefit some analgesic benefit in the context of neuropathic pain for these agents, with some also showing no benefit. And if you look at this list, you're probably saying, but wait a minute, a lot of these aren't really pure NMDA receptor antagonists, that's true. So actually I had an undergraduate student in my lab just this past week, Linda Cho, bravely tackle the challenge of going into this beta analysis and looking more specifically at the antagonists that are known to the block um, NMDA receptors. They may have other targets as well, but they're known to at least thought some of their mechanism in action could be through NMDA receptors. And so those are ketamine, memantine, amantadine, and dextromethorphan. And so for these eight, for those papers, the clinical trials with these agents, 20 of 22 studies showed some analgesic effects. So, so there was some effects in, in vivo, in, in humans, in neuropathic pain populations of these agents. But there was also adverse events that were common for many of these antagonists. And so before I go on to, to highlight some of the limitations of these clinical, clinical trials, I, almost, I also wanted to note these are general NMD receptor antagonists that are being tested because they've already been clinically approved. There's also more newer generation NMD receptor antagonists that, that preferentially act on certain subtypes of NMD receptors. And generally, those have failed in clinical trials in the past. But why is that the case? Well, maybe some of this, some of the shortcomings shown in these clinical trials might highlight why that could be the case. Because for these clinical trials that showed some efficacy, the age varied widely. The age, the average age or median age varied from 18 and a half years all the way to 58, 58 years. So you see that there's age as a variable can vary between, between studies and could be, be a potential compound. Another thing to variable to consider, which is shown here on the left, is sex. And so actually in 19 of 22 studies included both sexes in their study design. So sex is, there is the male and females in most of these clinical trials. But once we looked in, and when I say we, Linda really looked into these studies, what she found was actually results were analyzed by sex in only one of those 22 studies. And actually for that study, they just said there was no significant effect. So no details were really provided in terms of the analysis. So basically, we're in the dark in terms of knowing the efficacy, safety of these of these tests across sex and including sex as a biological variable. So that leads to this translational divide where we have targets and and mechanisms that are identified through our preclinical models and we're trying to shoot them across and and have them be successful in specific clinical pain syndromes and we and as i said a lot of, of a lot of those attempts are failing and so why could that be ca the case there's many different reasons i'm not trying to claim these are the only reasons why we have failures in clinical trials but some of the reasons could be that on the preclinical side of, of the discovery and target identification a lot of this work is done most of it's actually done in rodents, at least historically, it was predominantly done in male rodents. And when we're talking about physiology, a lot is done in juvenile male rodents. So we have kind of these variables. Whereas when we look at the clinical side, when we're thinking of pain, a lot of pain syndromes are more predominant in females, obviously because it's clinical, we're thinking of humans, so a different species. The prevalence of many pain conditions also increases as we age. So, so typically adult is your typical um, typical patient and for those clinical trials we saw they're they're in adulthood too. So what my lab and, and other labs are doing is trying to test the underlying assumption that these targets and mechanisms that, that are investigated and discovered in these preclinical models, are they really conserved across these variables of development, sex, and species? 
and so that's that's what we're trying to tackle and for one of for one of the examples that we're that we're tackling these questions is going back to those excitatory and MD receptors that we know are so critical for pain processing. And so the two main questions that I'm going to be talking about today are how does the dysregulation of these spinal and MD receptors potentially contribute to chronic pain as we look across both sex between males and females and species. And then based on the discoveries of this, I'm going to be talking about more recent work. Well, this is also recent work, but even more recent work, actually unpublished work. So I should say, please don't be sharing these results. I know it's going to be available after, but please don't be sharing because because I'm going to be talking about unpublished work in the second half where I'm where I'm going to be looking sorry, where we are looking at whether the molecular and functional properties of these receptors are different across sex and species at baseline. Are, are they different for acute pain processing? And so that's what I'll in the second half of the talk. Okay, so let's jump in then and look at this dysregulation of spinal and MDA receptors. So my lab's been working on this mechanism since actually I started studying this as a postdoc in Mike Salter's lab, as Andre was saying. And I've continued this um, line of research now in, in my own lab. And we've been looking at this mechanism of BDNF driving hyperexcitability within dorsal horn spinal pain signaling neurons. I'm going to go through this quick because actually two years ago, I gave a webinar on this for antibiotics. And so this is just kind of a recap. Um, and for those that missed it, I'm going to touch on the highlights, but I really want to kind of talk about more new stuff as well. So what happens here in this model, in, in this mechanism that's in male rodents, so I should be highlighting and what I'm going to show first of all is in male rodents, when we have in vivo models of inflammatory pain as well as a nerve cuff model of neuropathic pain, but the, the results here I'm going to show are further the inflammatory pain where you have CFA injection into the paw, which causes pain hypersensitivity that has a spinal uh, mediated component. So in the CFA inflammatory pain rats, we've identified this mechanism where you have BDNF causes being released and depending on the model whether it's inflammatory neuropathic pain the source of BDNF can differ but we're really focused here on what's happening within the dorsal horn pain signaling neurons and so what we see is that BDNF drives a down regulation of this chloride co-transporter KCC2 and these are western blots on synaptosomes specifically from the superficial dorsal horn so the pain processing region of, of the spinal cord and you see in the CFA rats you have decreased KCC2 protein that leads to a loss of the proper maintenance of the low chloride gradient within these superficial dorsal horn neurons, which the breakdown of that chloride gradient means you lose GABA-mediated inhibition, otherwise known as disinhibition. We found this disinhibition then directly drives this loss of this molecular break, this phosphatase known as STEP61. And so here you see decreased active, at least the active form of STEP61 at superficial dorsal horn synapses following CFA. Step 61 is a break. This phosphatase is a break on fin kinase, which is a member of the SARC family kinase, as well as a subtype of NMD receptor, GLUN2B containing NMD receptors. It phosphorylates both of those targets. So because we lose this molecular break, step 61, now BDNF subsequently can cause the phosphorylation and activation of this kinase, fin kinase, which will then phosphorylate and increase the activity and trafficking of GLUN2B and MD receptors to dorsal horn synapses. And so what all this biochemistry, all these changes in these markers ultimately means in terms of functionality, we've seen through patch clamp recordings, is that you have significantly increased synaptic and MD receptor responses in this model of inflammatory pain, and we see the same thing in the model of neuropathic pain. Just a real quick note, these are outward, so these are miniature excitatory postsynaptic currents. We do a trick where we record at plus 60, so it's outward, so you have that fast AMPA component, but the response is really dominated by the NMD receptor mediated component. So this mechanism, we see this loss of inhibition directly driving increased excitation, and it's this vicious cycle, and actually our collaborator, Eve DeConnick, has recent work showing it's circular where the increased NMD receptor is required for the subsequent internalization and degradation of KCC2. So the loop really does go around and around in circles. And this loop can also be driven by BDNF itself. If you take spinal cord tissue out of a naive rat and treat it in BDNF, it drives this same potentiation of synaptic NMD receptor responses. So the next question then is, and, and it kind of highlighted at the beginning of this talk, if we're trying to move from, we have all these potential drug targets, 
but are they appropriate for, for potential further work in humans? So the first question then, is this mechanism relevant in humans? And so we've been really fortunate to investigate these type of things in human tissue because of this collaboration with a neurosurgeon that's located at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, Dr. Eve Sai, and she's really been foundational. She had set up this um, ethical um, organ donation program where after um, patients and, and their families consent for organ donation, they also consent for, for the use of spinal tissue for, for scientific research. And so in partnership with Eve, with Dr. Sai, that means we can, we can get these neurologic determination of death donors. They're in the OR, and so what happens is their bodies are cooled, they're perfused with protective solution, and then after stopping the heart, heart with the aortic cross clamping and removing, as I said, those organs for donation and imp to improve and save lives, our team can come in, led by Dr. Sai, as well as, as, as postdocs, um, Amory Dedek in the lab and, and students, Jess Parnell, are often right in the OR. And so it means we can go in and collect that spinal cord tissue really quickly and under conditions similar to really pre preserve viability in terms of reducing mechanical damage and trauma to the tissue and placing it in neuroprotective solution immediately, which is chilled and, high and oxygenated. So that means within one to three hours of, of cross clamping, we can, we can have this tissue and we can directly, we have a lab space right at the Ottawa hospital. So it means we can directly bring it back to the lab and for science experiments. And so this really creates this unique opportunity where we can use the same type of approaches that, we're, that we've been studying spinal mechanisms of pain processing in rodents in human spinal cord tissue. Because for example, we can treat adjacent regions of, of the tissue from one donor. I should say most of these donors are non-chronic pain donors. So, but we can have in a dish model of chronic pain where BDNF, which we know is, drives that hyperexcitability pathway, at least for male rodents, we can test whether the same thing occurs for male humans, for example. And then as you'll see, as well as in females. And we can do that using the same type of approaches, using electrophysiology, Western blotting on those synaptosomes, specifically from the dorsal horn for pain processing, immunostating, looking at specific targets in specific regions of the, of the human spinal cord. And so those, that's some of the approaches that, that I'll be highlighting today. We're also, more recently, we've been collaborating with Dr. Ariel Levine at the NIH, along with Emmanuel Berne and a neurosurgeon partner in Montpellier, where they also are collecting viable human samples to do single nuclear RNA-seq on, to develop a single cell seq atlas for the human spinal cord. And there is a preprint out from that, but I'm not gonna be talking about that work today. I just wanna highlight, because I think it's another important avenue of future research to uncover some of these mechanisms of pain processing that are happening in the spinal cord. So back to our mechanism. I was talking about BDNF and how it drives that loss of breaks, increased gas, which ultimately potentiates excitatory synaptic NMD receptors in male rodents. So what about male humans? So if we using the same approaches, using that synaptosome prep, and I should say this work was done by Jean Zhu. At the, he was initially with Paul Lombroso, and then he was in a different lab at Yale University. And what John's Western showed from the synaptosomes is we see the same decrease in these inhibitory markers, KCC2 and STEP, that molecular break, at human dorsal horn synapses driven by BDNF treatment, as we saw in the rodents. So you have loss of these inhibitory signaling processes increased in the excitatory, increased in phosphorylated or active fin, increased in phosphorylated or potentiated GLUN2B, no effect on a control, a different subtype of NMD receptor GLUN2A. So you see a similar mechanism here in male humans. So it seems that this pathological mechanism is conserved across species as we move from rodents to humans. Well, what about sex? And so if we go back to one of our in vivo models, the CFA and model of inflammatory pain, from when, when Amory did the behavioral studies from these animals before doing any subsequent experiments, she saw the same tactile allodynia, less force or paw withdrawal threshold is lowered in these CFA rats compared to vehicle injected rats, and that persists for days. And so you have this hypersensitivity in male rats, a similar hypersensitivity in female rats. And I think in research in general, when we see these kind of conserved behavioral phenotypes, we can think, okay, there's no difference. There's no sex difference here. Things are conserved. 
But what about the underlying mechanisms that's driving this behavioral phenomena, in this case, pain hypersensitivity? And so we used these animals, collected their spinal cords, and looked at what was happening in the superficial dorsal horn. And what we found was that in the male rats, and this is showing what we've shown before, you see the decrease in inhibitory markers, KCC2 and STEP increased in excitatory markers in the synaptosomes from the male rats. In the female rats, we saw nothing in terms of no significant effects on the inhibitory markers in the superficial dorsal horn, no significant effects on, the, on these excitatory markers. But you could say, okay, well, that's correlative. You're not seeing targets, but do you really know this mechanism is, is, is really is sexually dimorphic between males and females in these rats? So to kind of, for the smoking gun evidence, Amory did patch clamp recordings and looked at the synaptic NMDA receptor responses from these CFA rats. And what she found was that in male rats, that in vivo CFA model induces that robust potentiation of synaptic and MDA receptor responses. That ex vivo treatment with BDNF just before recording for about an hour causes that same robust potentiation. Whereas in the female rats, the in vivo CFA inflammatory model BDNF causes no significant potentiation. So you saw the striking difference where you see the, the potentiation pathway, NMDA potentiation pathway in male but not female rats using multiple lines of evidence. So then, is this, we see the sex difference in, in, in spinal pain processing or spinal nociception in rodents. What about humans? So we did biochemistry work, the Western blot work, um, which showed the same thing as I just showed you in, in, in rats, I should say, as in humans, we saw similar results as that in our human tissue. I'm not going to show that right now, but we also collaborated with our, uh, with Eve DeConnick, led by Louis Etienne Lorenzo's group or, and, and team in Eve DeConnick's lab. And what Louis Etienne found is when we looked at that KCC2 marker, which is in the membranes of these dorsal horn cells, what, what he saw and what they saw is when you treated the human tissue with BDNF, you have a decrease in membrane KCC2 and an increase in intracellular KCC2. So you have an internalization of KCC2 induced by BDNF at human dorsal horn, superficial dorsal horn neurons. That was in male humans. In contrast, in females, we saw none of that none of that internalization. So you really see this striking difference in that internalization of KCC2 across sex, where it's being driven by BDNF in males, but not in, in females. So we have the sexual dimorphism in the coupling between BDNF-mediated disinhibition coupled to NMDA potentiation that's conserved across, across species from rats to humans. So the next question is, well, what could be driving that difference? And so based on uh, our earlier paper in 1993 by Jeff Mogul's group, there was evidence to suggest at least NMD-dependent um, stress-induced analgesia, there was a, a sex difference in that, in that phenomenon. And it appeared to be dependent on female sex hormones just before puberty. So we used the same approach. And as part of Amory's thesis, when I say we, most of this is Amory's uh, research that I'm, I'm presenting here. Um, so we used overectomized female rats to remove the effects of sex hormones, but just before puberty. So this is kind of the effects of these female sex hormones across later postnatal development. And so when we did over overectomy on these female rats and let them mature into adulthood and then sectioned their spinal cords, we saw no difference at baseline between naive and OVX female rats, where you see no difference in the, in the properties of these synaptic and MD receptors. However, at this adult stage, once you've removed um, the, the female sex hormones just before puberty, now if you treat the spinal sections with BDNF, you see this male-like phenotype or male-like mechanism where you see robust potentiation of the synaptic NMDA receptor responses. And this potentiation was blocked by blocking Sark family kinases, including FIN with, with the inhibitor PP2. So the same NMDA potentiation pathway if we remove the ovaries just before puberty. So it, from this, we're concluding that this sex difference in this neuronal mechanism of spinal hyperexcitability is really dependent on female sex hormones, but in later postnatal development. And so then just to summarize this part of the talk, what we've identified is that there's this BDNF-mediated pathway that involves TREC-B, KCC2, STEP, and FIN, 
which causes the potentiation of NMDA receptors in males, but not the NMDA um, potentiation pathway is not found in females. And that's conserved, that, that difference is conserved from rats to humans. So besides where one aspect of the lab is investigating well, what's driving hyperexcitability and chronic pain in, in females, but another kind of question, we found this big difference in, in sex in terms of dysregulation of NMDA receptors is, well, what about baseline properties? Do the molecular and functional properties of synaptic NMDA receptors in these superficial dorsal horn pain processing circuits, do they differ between males and females? And do they differ across species from rodents to humans? It kind of in terms of in a baseline or acute physiological pain processing. And so to look at the molecular, molecular aspects of this mechanism, we've, we've used immunohistochemistry. And this work was started by a master student, Santina Temi, in the lab. She started with um, juvenile, rodent juvenile um, spinal cords, and that's been published in this publication below. And Jennifer Armstrong has continued this work looking at adult rats and then, and then continuing on to adult humans. And so that's, the, that's what we're going to show. So the approach here that we're using is we're identifying the superficial dorsal horn with CGRP labeling, immunohistochemistry, to identify the superficial dorsal horn and quantify specific gluin 2 remember those are subtypes of NMD receptors, gluin 2A, B, C, and D, for example, quantify them in this pain processing superficial dorsal horn versus the remainder, the deeper dorsal horn that's mainly involved in other forms of somatosensory processing. And we're also, in terms of just the specifics, we're using antigen retrieval as we with heat and pepsin, as we found that's key to revert um, to uncovering the epitopes um, and the, and to label these synaptic NMD receptors as well as that extra synaptic NMD receptors in this tissue. And we're doing similar approaches for both adult rat and human, as I'm going to show. So what we've found is that could, similar to what what past evidence has shown, both in terms of uh, immunohistochemistry, in, in situ hybridization studies, and functional studies. Where we find, and we'll, let's look at the rats first, where there's high expression of gluN2A, gluN2B, and gluN2D subtypes of NMDA receptors in the superficial dorsal horn. They're preferentially localized to the superficial dorsal horn in adults, rats, This in this example I'm showing female, but it's similar as I'm going to show you in a sec, in adult male rats as well. And you see in human tissue, we see the same type of localization patterns. You see enrichment for all three of these subtypes of NMDA receptors in the superficial dorsal horn versus the deep dorsal horn in human spinal cord tissue for both females and males. I should quickly point out, we didn't look at gluN2C because single recent single cell um, seq data, as well as previous um, in situ hybridization and staining data, show, data has shown minimal transcripts of gluN2C in the dorsal horn. So we see the same subtypes of NMD receptors across both sex and species. And that's shown here in our quantification, where you see the ratio of in the superficial dorsal horn versus deep dorsal horn. You see enhanced um, localization to the superficial dorsal horn for all three subtypes across sex here in rats and for all three subtypes across sex here in humans as well. But as some of you are looking at these slides, even just by eye, if you kind of look at the expression pattern within the superficial dorsal horn, you may start to see a pattern. And this was actually pretty surprising for us is what, what you see here is there seems to be this enrichment to the lateral regions of the superficial dorsal horn within adult rats. And so Jennifer went on to quantify this by doing kind of a line scan analysis within that CGRP superficial dorsal horn region and looking at intensity as we move across this medial lateral axis. So medial starting at zero, lateral kind of being in the increase in length. And what Jennifer found when she quantified this data is you see this substantial and robust effect where you see enhanced um, localization of all three subtypes of NMDA receptors here to the lateral superficial dorsal horn. And you don't see that same difference in humans. You have equal distribution across the medial lateral axis for humans. So this seems to be a species difference. And this could relate to the somatotopic mapping um, and the role of NMDA receptors in potentially like the paw of the rat versus kind of more axial areas of the rat. So we have further experiments to further controls to do for this. We are seeing this trend follow other trends. So we, we don't think it's artifact, but we are doing other controls to, to really unpack the meaning of, of these surprising findings. 
Before I move on, one other really quick point here is that, so there's this robust difference, uh, well, sorry, there's this difference across species. The effects seem to be highly conserved across sex in terms of all of our findings so far in the adult tissue. We also see significant changes across postnatal development as we move from juvenile to adult rats. So for example, this effect of the mediolateral um, axis, that seems to change across development, which is another key that it, that it might have biological, real biological meaning. So we're unpacking those changes in NMD receptor expression and function across postnatal development as well. But that's newer work and I'm not gonna be talking about that today. Okay, so that's, Basically, the take home message here is the same subtypes of NMD receptors are found in the superficial dorsal horn across both sex and species, but we do see this slight species difference, at least in terms of the medial lateral distribution of those receptors. What about function? So, Anne Marie, as part of her um, PhD work and now continuing as a postdoc, as well as working with a really talented and motivated at the time honors thesis student, Amina Topku, did this analysis of patch clamp recordings. And so you can see these are patch clamp recordings from male and female rats and male and female humans. And these are lamina one neurons. And so in our first analysis, we were using criteria that kind of bias for gluin 2 b containing receptors. And you see here, the overall biophysical properties seem to be quite conserved across sex and across species. But we did notice when we were using this criteria, we were missing some really slow decaying events as well as some really fast decaying events because we were kind of biasing and there's technical reasons why we were doing that, but we were, we were missing some of the events. So we used a more unbiased criteria to capture all these synaptic and uh, miniature excitatory postsynaptic events. And what we found was this really surprising and, and large degree of heterogeneity within individual lamina one neurons. And so these are representative individual cells for male and female rats and then male and female humans. So you can see there's really fast decaying events all the way to really slow decaying synaptic events within one cell. So it shows there's heterogeneity from one synaptic response to another synaptic response within a given lamina one neuron. So what could these decay co um, rates correspond to? Well, based on lots of past physiology studies, we know that the decay rates that are really fast in the one to 20 range can correspond to APA mediated dominated synaptic responses. Whereas the, the next ones would be gluin2a in the 20 to 100 decay rate. Then we have gluin2b kind of in this middle range from 100 to 400 and then we start to see the contribution of gluin 2D containing receptors as we move from 400 to 1000, especially as we move beyond 1000. And so we could bin our results to look at the relative contribution. And that's also based on our confidence <clears throat> in these different subtypes that are present in these neurons in based on past pharmacological studies where we recorded from lamina one neurons of adult male rats and found that there are these, if you add a blocker for gluin 2A, there's a small contribution of fast um, decaying gluin2a mediated receptors. You have a dominant contribution of slightly slower decaying gluin2b containing receptors. And we also have a contribution of the slowest decaying gluin2d containing receptors based on antagonists that specifically brought block those subtypes. And so what we found here is using this kind of biophysical approach of looking at the difference in the decay kinetics we see that once again, showing the same kind of thing as I showed from that representative cell, but now for averages for many cells, you see there's these events that correspond to AMPA mediated synaptic dominated events, gluin2a dominated events, gluin2b and gluin2d. So within given individual lamina one neurons, you have this intraneuronal heterogeneity. You have different synaptic responses. And that heterogeneity is conserved across sex as well as across species. We see that same different uh, percent of events, or we see contributions of all of these different types of events as we move across both sex and species. But notably here, we can't do, it's slightly different the preparation, so we can't do direct stats here, but it seems there's more contribution of fast decaying gluin2a mediated events in humans potentially compared, compared to rats. And so the last experiment that I'll show here today is just to add confidence to this, at least proof of concept of do we really know these decay rates correspond to these specific molecular identities? So for a representative cell, we were able to do pharmacology with three different blockers that block the different subtypes. And so here at saline, you see the contribution of all the different um, 
decay rate um, events. And as we add rho, which is rho 256981, which is a blocker of glue N2A, B, sorry, glue N2B, you start to see a decrease in glue N2B um, decay, corresponding decay rates. Once we added rho and DQP, the blocker of glue N2D, you start to lose both those intermediate decay rates as well as the slow decaying decay rates. I should say the time here that it probably wouldn't be in com fully complete block, and that's why you probably see some events remaining because now we added the blocker of glue N2B, glue N2D, as well as TCN, which blocks glue N2A. And what do you have left? Mainly the AMPA component and some of the fast decaying component left. And so you can, this kind of provides proof of concept that you really do see all of these different molecular identities at individual synapses within a given lamina one neurons neuron and so that could mean there's could be synapse specific modes of plasticity within individual lamina one pain signaling neurons depending on what the synaptic inputs are and where those synapses are and so there's lots of work to understand the meaning and context for this but it's pretty cool that that's conserved um, through these patch clamp recordings we've been able to show that this physiology seems to be quite well conserved across both sex and species and so the main take-home messages then just to wrap up are that in general we found the molecular, molecular and functional properties of synaptic NMD receptors at dorsal horn pain signaling synapses are quite well conserved at baseline and across sex and fairly well conserved across species but we did I did highlight a couple examples of where you are seeing those species differences there at baseline. Then I didn't talk about it today, I briefly touched on it, but, but there appears to be striking changes in both the molecular identity and function of dorsal horn um, synaptic NMDRs as we move across later postnatal development, as we move kind of across puberty from the juvenile to adulthood. And so more work, stay tuned for more work to, on that to come. And then lastly, in the first part of the talk, we I, I started with talking about that mechanism that dysregulates and potentiates NMDA receptors that's driven by BDNF to cause hyperexcitability that is found in males but not females and that sexual dimorphism um, exists in both rodents and in human tissue models of pathological pain. So I'd like to close by thanking the lab members and the ones in bold are the ones that directly contributed to the work that I showed today as well as many fantastic collaborators that have been key to the work that, that I've shown, funding that enabled it all possible. Really a special thanks to the Trillium Gift of Life and the organ donors, their selfless sacrifice is what enables um, this kind of translational work to, to occur. And we definitely don't take that lightly and really try to treat it as the precious gift that it is. And lastly, a really quick shameless plug for the scientific meeting that's coming up for the Canadian Pain Society, which I'm helping organize, which will be at Banff, a beautiful location, May 10th to 12th next year. So. Stay tuned for announcements and symposia submission possibilities in the fall. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mike, for a wonderful presentation. We already have uh, a number of questions that have come in, and please continue to type in uh, your questions in the in the chat box uh, on the web browser. So uh, there's a couple of questions that I'll try to uh, condense so all related to age so first of all confirmation that yes you've used all the spinal cord uh, human samples from adult donors is that correct correct and that is and so there are definitely limitations with humans like the human tissue so there's there's quite a wide range so all the way from the extremes of the range are from like 20 to 70 i say typically uh, the most of our donors are kind of in the 30 to 50 30 to 60 kind of range but it is true that there's there's a big age range. And so that's something as we increase the samples, we could start to look at that variable. And maybe as right. well, then look at variable in rodents to see if we see differences. Right, and somebody in fact was asking if you've already been able to identify differences between uh, female human donor samples between pre and postmenopausal uh, women. We didn't, we're way underpowered, so we can't, I can't make any firm conclusions on that because we really get less, in our hands, we get less, a lot less um, female donors than male donors, but we haven't seen, like for that mechanism and, and the lack of kind of those changes, we didn't seem kind of pre and post menopausal, we didn't really seem to see any major differences, but we're talking okay. about very low end, so I can't make firm conclusions, but it doesn't seem to impact that mechanism, at least at our first pass. Um, approximation.
Yeah. And in your in vitro model with uh, either rat or human spinal cord, how long was BDNF uh, on the tissue? Yeah, this is one of those quirky fizz 70 minutes. Because <laughs> at the time when I started, that's it was based on Eve DeConning's work. And and uh, now there's I think Ted Price too has paper. So basically that was a time point where you see this robust mechanism to already occur to already occur. We have follow-up work that actually Amory's working on now as an industrial postdoc, where we're trying to look at the effects of BDNF in real time using multi-electrode array systems to really see the timing and the time-dependent changes of excitability and spatial changes across the dorsal horn network to really tease that apart more. Okay. Another question is related to the, um, in the CFA pain model, you've shown that uh, phenotypically there is really no difference between males and females. Um, so what do you think is the underlying mechanism that, uh, that explains, in, some, in, in one case you've shown there is clearly a, a male related mechanism that is yes. kind of, yeah, what, what would explain the, the similar phenotype? So the one thing I should point out too is that we're really mostly focusing on the NMDA receptors there. There is some evidence to suggest KCC2 is, at least in terms of its role in disinhibition, the GABA changes in females in some of these models. And that's driven, actually interesting, Ted Price's group with Eve DeConnick have shown that's driven by CGRP. So that's one potential mechanism where maybe CGRP is acting on mechanisms to induce this. The other thing though that I should point out is just like I showed all those targets at the beginning, I don't presume to say this is the only mechanism that's driving hyper excitability. So there could be completely independent mechanisms of any of these markers that could also be driving hyper excitability in females that don't depend on, on these specific targets that we're investigating. And perfect. And there's another question related to this topic. Uh, um, any information about the effect of uh, the CFA treatment on AMPA receptors? on AMPA receptors. Oh, that's because I know in the nerve injury model, we looked at, at the AMPA, so we looked at the minis at minus 60 and saw no significant change. In the CFA, we haven't done that analysis. And I know this is one of those things, this is where if I ever, there, we kind of have an inkling that maybe something's going on, I think, but I haven't seen. So that's that's work we need to do, but that's a really good question. And that's, that's work we should follow up on because it is robust for the end. We were actually surprised the level of potentiation I would have, my guess would it be, it would have been smaller than the nerve injury or BDNF, but it was really a robust potentiation of these NMD receptors in the CFA um, rats, male rats. Okay. Another question is, uh, was wondering if the glutamatergic input to the NMDA receptors containing synapses you recorded from, are they from dorsal horn interneurons, from descending inputs, or from nociceptor afferents? That's a great point. It's gonna be a combination of all of them because these are minis, these are not evoked. And we're doing that because of the polysynaptic nature of the circuitry. So if you do evoked, especially with pharmacology, the tricky thing is since we know NMDA receptors are presynaptic, you won't know kind of the site of action. So that's our rationale for using the miniature excitatory postsynaptic current response um, um, uh, approach. But th that means it's gonna be a combination of synapses from interneurons, from afferents, from descending. And so that's where we need more work, kind of maybe looking, for example, if we move, this is in rats, but if we move to transgenic approaches, we could specifically stimulate afferents and see the differential responses. Yeah, okay. So, there. Then we have a question on, uh, could you comment on the translatability of the CFA pain model to human neuropathic pain clinical trials? A hundred percent. That's very far removed. <laughs> like these are starting points, and and that was that's another huge I think area of work that we need better translational models. I'm no way claiming these are they're probably not they're not going to be directly translatable. It's more a system to look at general dysregulation, but that's another kind of next step is looking at more like models of maybe arthritic pain, osteoarthritic pain, diabetic neuropathy, like some animal models that are closely related to specific human pain syndromes like diabetic neuropathy or arthritis. So yeah, I was just using that as an example when I, in terms of the neuropathic pain clinical trials, but I'm not trying to claim that these will map, our results are directly gonna map across to the differences found there, yeah. Okay, and another question is when you're recording the effects on KCC2, BDNF, uh, do you know if you're recording from inhibitory interneurons or uh, excitatory neurons or, or both? 
we're, it's probably going to be both. We do bias in the patch clamp recordings for large um, diameter cells. So that would kind of enrich for potentially the projection neurons in the population. But I should note, so we've, our lines of evidence are those patch clamp recordings, but also the Western blots on synaptosomes from the superficial dorsal horn in general, as well as some of our imaging, which has been on general superficial dorsal horn neurons. So I really do think this mechanism is kind of a general mechanism across subtypes that really just shifts the excitatory tome. It doesn't seem to be subtype specific because we do see it in, in for example, in our patch clamp recordings, we generally see it in almost all of our cells, which implies that it's not neural subtype specific. But I should say this is where few further single cell new, uh, sequencing data can point to hints because there could be subtleties and differences in, in, in these mechanisms and that's where we can really tease into that data and look at the expression of the NMDA receptors, some of these modulators, um, upstream modulators and see if they're preferentially expressed in subtypes of, of dorsal horn neurons both in, in rodents as well as in humans. Okay and another question is uh, the BDNF mechanism in the CFA model is it specific for hypersensitivity, mechanical, heat, uh, any specific type of pain? We haven't done in terms of that, in terms of the behavioral, like the different aspects. So that's a good question. But I, yeah, I'm trying to think uh, off the top of my head, just on the spot. I'm I'm not sure if it, if it would relate to the different hallmarks of pain, like if it would be mechanical specifically or if it would be thermal too. But that's a good question and yeah. If whoever that is, email me, reach out, and then I can think about it a bit more deeper and maybe get back to you with a, with a better answer. <laughs> okay. Another question is, uh, th this mechanism involving sexual dimorphism between uh, BDNF and NMDA receptor modulation, are there other examples uh, in the CNS, in other regions where uh, similar male-female differences have been reported? Male, female, and that's really the problem. I need to dive into that more. But it's really, especially when you look at physiology, like synaptic NMD receptor responses, it is so dominated by males. It's unbelievable. Or or unsexed. They just don't state the sex. So it's yeah. really hard to know. I'm trying to think. Well, definitely in terms of NMD receptor regulation, there's a, there's really good examples of that in, in the brain. And I'm forgetting, shoot, I'm forgetting the author. And that's shame on me. Um, for that, but there's a good examples of estrogen receptors, for example, differentially regulating NMDAs, NMDAs and plasticity in, in males versus females. I think it's the amygdala. So that's one example. Some of these, there's some evidence to suggest like baseline expression might be different for some of these, for some of these elements, BDNF signaling as well. There's, there's evidence for sex differences. So yes, there's evidence. I don't think in terms of this full mechanism, it's been investigated, but that would be a great thing. And if anyone's interested in kind of collaborating, to look at some of the detailed elements of this mechanism because it has been for example in the hippocampus many of these elements have been shown to drive um, plasticity in that case not just necessarily pathology but most of that work has been done in males okay. and are you planning to conduct any of these studies in uh, human spinal cord donors that were affected by chronic pain yes the the tricky thing is well yes and no <laughs> We're really limited because we're working with one neurosurgeon, one hospital, so by the number of donors that we get. And so just a probability, because these are like typically like stroke or trauma or, or various kind of acute um, events like that, they're typically not chronic pain or at least not identifiable in terms of having a specific chronic pain condition. But that's where we can increase the sample number and that's where various groups like Anabios, but like also Transplant, like Ted Price's group, like Rob Drow's group, like Gold. There's many groups, I'm probably sorry if I'm missing you, Emmanuel Bernay in France, that are getting these kind of higher throughputs that then can, can look at some of those questions of mechanisms in kind of naive or non-pain states versus chronic pain states. All right. Well, I want to thank you again, uh, Mike, and thank all the attendees for this uh, Great presentation and uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you everyone to the audience for, for tuning in and all of those great questions. And, and please feel free to email me if you have follow-up questions or anything you'd like to discuss relating to this work. Great, thank you all, bye. Thank you, bye.